Welcome to the Money Metals Midweek Memo. News and commentary relating to sound money, the precious metals markets, and the economy. I'm your host, Mike Meharry. Thanks for tuning in. I was in an antique shop with my wife not too long ago, and they had signs everywhere proclaiming, you break it, you buy it. Well, the government has a little bit of a different twist on that phrase. We break it, and you buy it. Now, that's certainly true of the economy. They broke the heck out of it, and we are going to pay for it sooner or later. Now, you might be thinking, but Mike, this economy looked good. I mean, Joe Biden says so. Didn't you see the awesome GDP print? And the jobs. Look at all the jobs. Now, you do know that something can look good and still be all broken up, right? We bought our house a couple of years ago, and we knew there were some cosmetic problems when we made an offer. So we were already planning on doing some renovations, but then we had the home inspection. Turns out there were all kinds of wiring problems. Now, of course, we couldn't see them. It wasn't like wires were hanging out of the walls, but it was a ticking time bomb. If the issues weren't addressed, it was going to cause us big problems It was just a matter of time. The U.S. economy is pretty much just like that. It looks okay from a distance, but there is all kinds of rot under the surface. Just consider the GDP. Economist Daniel LaCow made a couple of really good points in an article on his website. He said an increase in real GDP of $1.5 trillion with an increase in public debt of more than $2 trillion is not a strong economy. It is a bloated economy. Furthermore, there is nothing positive in consumption when personal savings as a percentage of disposable income was only 3.7% in December, and disposable personal income in 2017 has basically stagnated. American consumers are buying fewer things with their salary. He went on, we cannot forget that one of the biggest drivers of the fourth quarter increase in real GDP was an abrupt reduction in the GDP deflator, which came in at 1.5%, less than half the previous reading of 3.3%. This is a massive boost to real GDP from a reduction in the inflation estimate that most Americans have not seen at all. In other words, They kind of rigged that GDP number by making inflation less. And we all know that inflation isn't that much less. In fact, I see a lot of prices that are still going up rapidly. Meanwhile, credit card debt is at an all-time high. Another signal that, you know, maybe the American consumer isn't quite as healthy as the spending would have us believe. So, yeah, the economy is broken. But it still runs, right? until it doesn't. You know, it it reminds me a little bit of the Plymouth Horizon that I drove when I was in college. My mom called it a rattle trap. Now, as far as I was concerned as an 18, 19 year old, heck, it got me where I was going. But the fact of the matter was, it was subject to breaking down pretty much at any given moment. It was a fundamentally unsound car. The Federal Reserve exacerbated the problems in the economy with interest rate hikes to fight price inflation. Now, I'm not saying they shouldn't have raised rates. What I'm saying is they shouldn't have created the inflation to begin with. But inflation is the lubricant that makes this economy go. And honestly, they really didn't have a lot of choice. I talked about the inflation tax in last week's show, and if you didn't hear it, do check it out because I explain exactly how we got where we are with this inflation mess. And I explain exactly why the federal government needs inflation and the Federal Reserve willingly gives it to them. Anyway, from the government's point of view, the recent bout of inflation wasn't really the problem. The problem was inflation got away from them and you noticed. That forced the Fed to raise rates, but as soon as it can get away with it, it's going to go right back to creating inflation. Like I said, the economy needs the inflation. It runs on inflation. Inflation is the mother's milk of this economy. But in the meantime, we do have 
higher interest rates. Now, they're not historically high. In fact, if you look at the Federal Reserve's, uh, it's the Chicago Fed, they have a uh, monetary conditions index. And if you look at that, you'll actually find that monetary conditions right now are still historically loose. So they haven't done all that much when it comes to making financial conditions tighter. But they are tight when you need artificially low interest rates and money creation in order to make the economy go. All that to say that they are going to break things with the higher interest rates. I mean, they've already broken things. Remember the banking crisis last March that started with Silicon Valley Bank going kaput? The Fed managed to paper that over with a bailout. But something else will break. It's just a matter of time. The commercial real estate market is a good candidate for breakage. And I'm going to talk a little bit about what's going on with the commercial real estate market because it's indicative of what the Fed has done to the overall economy. So here's the Cliff's Notes version. According to research by the National Bureau of Economic Research, approximately 300 regional banks are at risk of collapse due to problems in the commercial real estate sector, sometimes referred to as CRE. Now, you remember Silicon Valley Bank, I just mentioned it, kind of like that. The International Monetary Fund is also flashing warning signs. In a recent blog post, IMF economists said that the global commercial real estate market is under, quote, intense pressure due to rising interest rates. Now, the United States has the biggest commercial real estate market in the entire world. According to the IMF, commercial real estate prices dropped by 11% since the Fed started hiking rates in 2022. This precipitous drop in commercial real estate value totally wiped out the previous two years' gains. Now, historically, tightening cycles haven't had a significant impact on commercial real estate prices. If you go back to the last tightening cycle, which was between 2015 and 2019, and really just 2018 in earnest, but you go back to that period, commercial real estate actually boomed. And this is probably a function of the fact that even though they were kind of trying to raise rates, they were still historically low, even as the Fed was trying to normalize them. And they never got anywhere near normalizing them, by the way. We had that little stock market crash in 2018, the economy got shaky, and the Fed went right back to increasing its balance sheet and slashing interest rates. And Keep in mind, this was before the pandemic. The pandemic, I think I said this last week, the pandemic was a godsend for the government and the Federal Reserve because it allowed them to go all in on easy money and basically rescue an economy that was eh, dipping towards uh, some, some problems. But um, they kind of got a, a little reprieve there because of the pandemic. So anyway, the commercial real estate sector right now is facing a triple whammy of falling prices, falling demand, and rising interest rates. Now, those demand issues stem from the pandemic stupidity when the government thought it was a good idea to shut down the economy. The post-pandemic rise of telecommuting and work-at-home programs that have kind of continued on even after the pandemic, it's crushed demand for office space. Vacancy rates in commercial buildings have soared in recent months. And all of this has put significant stress on commercial real estate investors and commercial real estate companies. In fact, the biggest bankruptcy in 2023, and there was an elevated number of corporate bankruptcies last year, but the biggest one was the failure of the Pennsylvania Real Estate Investment Trust. And this company had loaded up with more than $1 billion in debt, and uh, eventually it went under. So the collapse of the commercial real estate market could easily spill over into the financial sector. Do you remember how problems in the subprime mortgage market took down the financial system? The situation in commercial real estate today is kind of similar. You have a lot of small and medium-sized banks with big exposure to commercial real estate loans. Bad commercial real estate loans. Because the value of commercial real estate is crashing, even as interest rates are rising. A lot of people, they're just not going to be able to pay off those loans. 
that's going to leave banks holding the bag. And they're not going to be able to recoup their losses because when they loan the money out, it was based on much higher real estate prices. So what I'm talking about here is ultimately big losses for banks. And to add to this problem, a lot of commercial real estate loans are coming due over the next several years. According to the Mortgage Bankers Association, around $1.2 trillion, with a T, $1.2 trillion of commercial real estate debt in the United States is going to mature over the next two years. According to TREP, which is a uh, commercial or a real estate data provider, there are uh, two $0.56 trillion in commercial real estate loans that will mature over the next five years, with $1.4 trillion of those held by banks. So all of that debt is going to have to be refinanced, right? That's a big problem for debtors who face much higher interest rates to borrow money on buildings that now have a much lower value. Tripp put it like this, with rates rising and credit conditions tightening, many loans may face an uphill battle as refinancing becomes more costly, especially if banks and other lenders look to reduce their CRE exposure, as we, as we saw happen during previous recessionary cycles. This could lead to lower property values and larger losses for lenders. Or, as the IMF put it, higher financing costs since the beginning of the tightening cycle and tumbling property prices have resulted in rising losses on commercial real estate loans. Stricter lending standards by U.S. banks have further restricted funding availability. So, when you boil it all down, there are a lot of commercial real estate investors out there who face the prospect of refinancing loans at much higher rates that they can't afford on properties that are rapidly losing value. This is not a good equation, right? So it's no wonder that there are a growing number of commercial real estate defaults. I'll give you just one example. There are many. But according to Bank of America's Q3 financial statement, the total value of non-performing loans, that means at least 90 days past due, increased to nearly $5 billion. And that was up from $4.27 billion in, in the second quarter. So almost a billion dollar increase. This huge increase was largely due to its commercial real estate portfolio. Now, Bank of America, it can handle it, right? You've got all of these big banks. They can handle this. It's, it's the two big to fail banks. No, no worries for them. But Reuters warned about what could happen uh, in a report last fall. They said weak demand for offices could trigger a wave of borrowers to default on their loans and put pressure on banks and other lenders, which are hoping to avoid selling loans at a significant discounts. The problem here is, it's not Bank of America, it's small and mid-sized regional banks hold a significant share of commercial real estate debt. In fact, they carry more than 4.4 times the exposure to commercial real estate loans than the major too-big-to-fail banks. According to an analysis by Citigroup, regional and local banks hold 70% of all commercial real estate loans. And according to a report by Goldman Sachs, banks with less than $250 billion in assets hold more than 80% of commercial real estate loans. So the IMF summarized the whole situation like this. Financial intermediaries and investors with a significant exposure to commercial real estate face heightened asset quality risks. Smaller and regional U.S. banks are particularly vulnerable as they are almost five times more exposed to the sector than larger banks. Rising delinquencies and defaults in the sector could restrict lending and trigger a vicious cycle of tighter funding conditions. Falling commercial property prices and losses for financial intermediaries with adverse spillovers to the rest of the economy. This sounds almost exactly like the scenario that played out with the subprime mortgage market leading to the 2008 financial crisis, right? But hey, don't worry. Everything is fine. Uncle Joe told me so. Also, economists and Fed officials keep insisting that the banking system is sound. Economists claim the issues in the commercial real estate market don't pose any kind of systemic risk. Everything will be okay. Take a deep breath, they claim. So, I mean, why should I worry? Why should you worry? 
Of course, these are the same people who told us the subprime problem in 2007 was contained, that inflation was transitory, and quantitative easing was a temporary program that would eventually be unwound. In other words, these people have a pretty awful track record when it comes to projecting into the future. So maybe you and I should worry. Now, as I said earlier, this is indicative of what's going on all over the economy. The commercial real estate sector is just one sector, but there are similar issues in many other sectors of the economy, and it's ultimately the central bank's fault. Now, most people will agree with me to a point. I mean, they may not see it nearly as badly as I do, but they will agree that the Fed has caused some potential problems in the economy moving forward. They will concede that the Fed's rate hikes have created some issues. In fact, that's exactly why everybody is so desperate for the rate cuts to begin, right? They want rate cuts because they know that this debt-riddled economy can't possibly plug along forever with 5.5% interest rates. They want the rate cuts. They love easy money. That drives the economy, right? So that's what they're looking for. So they would agree with me in that sense. They would say, yeah, the Fed maybe, maybe they went too far, or maybe they're gonna, you know, there's a danger they might hold interest rates high too long. And, and so that's a problem. But that's not really what I'm talking about. The Fed actually broke the economy long before the first rate hike. In fact, it started way back in the wake of the 2008 financial crisis. In fact, I would argue the problems go back to the 1980s and the 1990s, but we'll just start in 2006 for the sake of explanation. Everything that we're seeing today is all part and parcel of the business cycle driven by Fed monetary policy. Business cycle is kind of the fancy term. Boom bust cycle probably is a more accurate way to put it. When people talk about the economy, they generally focus on government policies like taxation, regulations. For instance, Republicans will credit President Trump's tax cuts for seemingly creating a booming economy and surging stock markets when he was in office. Meanwhile, Democrats will blame deregulation for the 2008 financial crisis. And it's true that government policies do have an impact on the direction of the economy. But their analysis almost always completely ignores the biggest player on the stage, and that's the Federal Reserve. You really can't grasp the economic big picture without understanding how the Federal Reserve's monetary policy drives this boom-bust cycle. The effects of these government policies all work within the Fed's monetary framework. Money printing and interest rate manipulations fuel booms, and the inevitable attempt to return to normalcy precipitates busts. In simple terms, easy money, low interest rates, money creation blows up bubbles, bubbles pop and set off a crisis, rinse, wash, repeat. In practice, when the economy slows or enters into a recession, central banks like the Federal Reserve drive interest rates down and launch quantitative easing programs to stimulate the economy. So it works like this. Low interest rates encourage borrowing and spending. The flood of cheap money suddenly available allows consumers to consume more, thus the stimulus. It also incentivizes corporations and government entities to borrow and spend. Coupled with quantitative easing, the central bank can pump billions, even trillions of dollars of new money into the economy through this loose monetary policy. Money creation, it helps fuel the boom. And that's exactly what happened after the 2008 financial crisis, right? The Fed pushed rates to zero, and then they left them there for nearly a decade. Meanwhile, it created some $4 trillion out of thin air by buying bonds and mortgage-backed securities, and it injected all of that liquidity into the economy. And then, of course, they doubled down on this policy during the pandemic. This monetary policy, as I mentioned already, results in a temporary boom. But temporary is the key word. All of that new money 
that they're creating. It has to go somewhere, right? Now, it could result in rising consumer prices like it did after the pandemic. Or it could primarily pump up the price of assets such as real estate, the stock market. Uh, that's what we saw after the dot-com bust and after the 2008 financial crisis. We primarily saw inflation manifest itself in asset prices. Because of the dynamics of the pandemic where we had a lot of people getting a lot of money and not producing anything, we actually saw a, a big increase in price inflation. So it can manifest in different ways. But regardless, the whole thing creates a fake wealth effect. This is what it did after the 08 uh, crisis. People feel wealthier because they see the value of their assets rapidly increasing. They see this stimulus money coming into their bank account. So with plenty of debt-driven spending and rapidly increasing asset prices, the economy grows sometimes at a staggeringly fast pace. Meanwhile, surging economic growth, shrinking unemployment, rising stock prices, all of this driven by money creation give you the illusion of a healthy economy. But the monetary policy hides the economic rot that's in the foundation. Like the problems with my wiring were hidden by the walls, right? You see where I'm going here, don't you? So in order to sustain an economic expansion, a real economic expansion, you need capital goods. You need factories, you need machines, you need natural resources. Those are the ingredients that go into creating wealth and expanding the economy. Capital goods are produced through savings and investment, not consumer spending. So when central banks juice consumption without the requisite underlying capital structure, it will eventually become impossible to maintain. I mean, you can print all of the dollars you want, but you can't print stuff, right? You can't print bricks, you can't print lumber, you can't print groceries. At some point, the credit-driven expansion will outstrip the available stock of capital. And at that point, the house of cards begins to collapse. Imagine if you plan to build a giant brick wall. And I don't know why you would want to build a giant brick wall, but let's pretend like you do. So you've got really low interest rates. You've got easy credit. You can borrow all the money you need to complete the job. So you look at it and you think, oh, yeah, I've got plenty of money available. This job, piece of cake. But then you get two thirds of the way through and there's a brick shortage. Now, you still got plenty of money, but you got no bricks. You can't buy bricks that don't exist. So your money is useless. You cannot finish the project. This scenario provides a very simplified picture of what happens in the economy during a Fed-fueled economic expansion. Flush with cash, investors begin all kinds of projects they will never be able to complete. Eventually, the malinvestments become apparent and the boom teeters, and then it collapses into a bust. And of course, the Fed helps this process along as well. Once the apparent recovery takes hold, in order to keep inflation under control, you know, because you don't want price inflation because people get mad, the Fed has to tighten monetary policy. So it ends the QE programs and it begins to nudge interest rates back up. It tries to normalize. The, the policy that we saw in the decade after the Great Recession, where interest rates were at zero, where we were getting all of this money injected to the economy, that wasn't normal. That was abnormal. So then they try to normalize things because, I mean, obviously, you want to get back to normal, right? When the economy appears to be back in full swing, the central bank may even shift to quantitative tightening, shrinking its balance sheet, which is something else that the Fed has been doing behind the scenes. We've had rate hikes and we've had balance sheet reduction, which incidentally, they're talking about ending balance sheet reduction. I wrote an article about that over, uh, over at moneymetals.com slash news. And you can check that out because there's some significant ramifications with balance sheet reduction, but I don't really have time to get into that during this show. Maybe I'll talk a little bit about that next week. But anyway, during the boom, governments, consumers, and companies pile up enormous amounts of debt because they're being incentivized to borrow, right? So then you get rising interest rates that increases the cost of servicing the debt. That's what we're seeing today. It also discourages new borrowing. So the easy money dries up. This speeds up the onset of the next recession and the cycle repeats itself. That's about where we are today. 
Here's the thing a lot of people miss. The impact of monetary policies, it, it doesn't manifest overnight. I'm convinced a lot of people think everything is fine today because, well, the Fed jacked up interest rates really fast and nothing happened. See, the economy can handle these interest rates. We're going to get a soft landing. Jerome Powell is Goldilocks. But the economy isn't a freaking microwave. You don't just put something in for 30 seconds and then voila, it's done. It takes time to cook. It's more like cooking in a conventional oven. The thing is, we live in a microwave society. You know, history goes back about two weeks. Everybody expects everything to be instantaneous. The news cycle is my most recent glance at my feed on X. And this is why I keep talking about the run-up to the 2008 financial crisis. I talk about it a lot because I think it's very informative and kind of illuminates where we are today. It puts things into some kind of historical perspective that makes sense. If you look back at the run-up to the Great Recession, the Fed lowered interest rates after the dot-com bubble collapsed in 2001. By 2003, Greenspan had slashed interest rates to 1%, which at the time was unprecedentedly low. Now, this incentivized a lot of borrowing, and it ultimately started blowing up the housing bubble. The Fed began nudging interest rates up higher in the summer of 2004. By February 2005, we were already seeing ripples of trouble in the overinflated housing market, but the Federal Reserve continued pushing rates up until they peaked in 2006. Yes, I said 2006 is when the interest rates actually peaked. Held them there for quite a while, kind of like they're holding rates now. And then by 2007, the Fed was already cutting interest rates, but the economy still looked fine. It wasn't until late 2008 that the financial crisis reared its ugly head. So if you compare that cycle today, we're still in early 2007. Heck, the Fed hasn't even made the first cut yet. My point here is that just because rate hikes have not broken anything yet, it doesn't mean they won't break anything ever. Now, I honestly think this cycle is going to move quicker than it did back then, because there's more debt, there's more malinvestments, the bubbles are bigger, but it still could be a while before we see the crisis emerge. And, you know, on a side note, this is why I keep saying that I expect something to break, I expect a deep recession, I expect a crisis, because I'm not looking at the data that some government agency released a couple of days ago. I'm looking at the macroeconomics, I'm looking at history, I'm looking at this boom-bust cycle, I'm looking at the way the economy functions over the long term. That's what is informing my viewpoint here. So. Anyway, I, like I said, I think it could be a while before we see a real crisis emerge. But if you believe the macroeconomics, and I do, it's coming. So here's the bottom line. It's wise to be prepared now. One of the ways you can prepare is to have hard assets that aren't going to devalue when the economy starts to implode, when inflation rears its ugly head, when the Fed starts creating money out of thin air again. Gold and silver are excellent hedges against this. And if you're interested in adding those things to your portfolio, now's the time. I encourage you to call Money Metals at 800-800-1865, or you can chat with folks online at moneymetals.com. You can even just order online if you have an idea of what you want. But we've got great folks over at Money Metals who can help you figure out maybe what products will work for you uh, and, and how things will fit into your investment strategy. But I encourage you to do it today. Because again, just because everything seems fine doesn't mean it's not fine. And I'm not just saying this to, to, to sell precious metals. I have precious metals. I'm saying this because I believe it's true, because I've been studying economics for a long time, and I can see the rot in the foundation that most people are missing. So with that, we're going to wrap up this episode of Money Metals Midweek Memo. You can get more information about the things that I've talked about and more over at moneymetals.com news. And, you know, if you want to get the latest news right in your inbox, 
You can sign up on our email list and we'll send articles to you. We'll send great information to you. Uh, of course, you can subscribe to the Midweek Memo on your favorite podcasting platform. You can email me, mike.mahary, M-A-H-A-R-R-E-Y at moneymetals.com. Make sure you tune in to our Market Wrap podcast on Friday. Thank you so much for listening to the show today and have a great rest of your week.